I was aware that I lived in a totally, completely segregated place and that the majority of the population were very unkind. My mother and father loved me dearly. They gave me such confidence. So when I went out and met other people, if someone saw me and didn't like me, that was their problem, not mine. Because if these two marvelous people loved me so much, I must be okay. That was a full house in Keele Auditorium on that night in December 1956. The ball went up, and Bob Pettit of the Hawks and I jumped for it. I got it. Coon, go back to Africa, you baboon. Watch out, Pettit. You'll get covered with chocolate. Black nigger. There was no doubt who the fans were yelling at. I was the only Negro athlete on either team. Being a high-profile athlete, there was a forum there for me if I choose to use it. And I choose to use it. Bill Russell may forever stand alone, but he's never walked alone because on every step of his life's journey, he's always known that every path he took, every choice he made, could transform the fate of all who followed him. Russell was a guy who called himself black. That was an offensive term when I grew up. But Russell called himself black and was proud of it. At a time when teams were still traveling through cities that practiced Jim Crow, Bill was someone who stood up and insisted on dignity. And he was willing to speak out. I left the hotel and I went to a, a restaurant down the street. The proprietor asked me what I wanted. I said, this is a restaurant, isn't it? I'd like to get something to eat. He told me no, so I walked out. I used to always say to him, you made me feel safe. Just psychologically, which is more detrimental to African Americans, and what you're made to think that you're inferior to justify somebody's injustice towards you. He taught you that he wasn't trying to seek your approval. His philosophy was simple, but resonated powerfully. Never lose your sense of self-respect. Always consider what may be bigger than yourself. And when the civil rights movement grew in the 1960s, that way of looking at the world was all the more important. It ought to be possible for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color. You can keep the club in your hand, but you cannot beat down just. Oh, race has nothing to do with it. It's like being tall or being short or being fat. It had nothing to do with it. But uh, at this point in the history of our country, it does have something to do with it. The problem that Bill saw was the fact that most white people don't see the ugly things that black Americans have to deal with. So they don't understand. And most white Americans don't believe it could have been that bad. But it was. 15 minutes past midnight, Evers got out of his car beside his home in a Negro residential area. A sniper fired a single shot. He died within an hour at a Jackson hospital. It was July 1963, and the phone rang at my home in Reading, Massachusetts. Charlie Evers was on the phone from Jackson, Mississippi. He said, I could use some help right now, but you may get killed. That summer, Russell went straight to the civil rights icon, Megger Evers' hometown. Megger's brother Charlie's idea was that he would host a series of basketball clinics for black and white kids together. I was very glad to come down. I've been uh, following what's happening here, and this is uh, very much a part of my life. Men like Megger Evers were dead, and the other men had taken up his flag. Charlie Evers was a man marked for death who slept with a pistol in his hand. The first night in Jackson, my friend couldn't sleep. They're coming for us. They're coming after us, he said. The kind of men who come after you in darkness do not frighten me.
See, Russell didn't wait until he was safe to stand up for what was right. Russell did that in the midst of winning 11 championships. He represented things that were right while he had something to lose. A few young people here that would like to be president of the United States, if you'd like to, don't give it up. You don't have to give it up. The gift someone like Bill Russell gave to somebody like me is an expectation that, yeah, there's nothing I can't do. And I don't have to shrink myself or think that there's a ceiling to what I can accomplish. I have a dream. He stayed on the front lines of the unrest later that summer, joining Martin Luther King and hundreds of thousands of others in the March on Washington. One big voice, which was to say, we are dissatisfied. As the 60s continued, he continued to stand tall alongside his peers, proudly, loudly, defiantly. He came out of friendship to Muhammad Ali. And in 1966, he made another kind of history, becoming the Celtics player coach. Brad, any final words of advice to the new coach? Win! <laughs> the first black head coach in any of the four major sports leagues. And the first league will coach, and you do the job impartially to not any racial prejudice in reverse. Yes. The most important factor is respect. And basketball respects the man for his ability, period. Russell wasn't the first African-American person who could coach a team. He was first provided with the opportunity. Let's make that very clear. I do think he knew the significance of that. Russell didn't say, I'm doing this for other blacks. He just did it. Then he won. The Boston Celtics are once again the world champions. I told these guys before the game, I don't care what happens. I wouldn't trade you guys for any guys in the world. He succeeded as a coach for the same reason he won so much as a player. For the same reason he made such an impact so far beyond the court. Bill Russell has never been about just himself. It's why he spent so much of his focus since he left the game, dedicating himself to the cause of mentorship, to the idea that life isn't worth living if you can't find a way to impact those who follow you. The championships, the activism, the refusal to accept injustice, they were never about just what he was doing. They were about being an inspiration for every generation to come. There's something very, very important to me, and that is the National Mentoring Partnership, interacting with the young folks on a face-to-face -face basis. <laughs> I only have one piece of advice for you. Do the best that you can, and not let somebody else set a standard for you. There's no greater gift that you can give a generation that follows you than uh, that sense that I am not better than anybody else, but nobody else is better than me either. I will give respect because I want to be respected. I will give respect because I want to be respected. I will rise because I can. I will rise because I can. A beautiful world, this country of ours, but it will never reach its full potential until we exploit and accept the contributions of every man. Long after my basketball world ends, my fight will go on. It is the fight of any American. For one of the most enjoyable but frustrating experiences in the history of man is to be an American Negro at this time. Where does it end? It ends somewhere far ahead of us. The fight will be long and hard, and it will not be won in my lifetime. But the issue is here. Silence in this matter would only be bigotry, and we have enough bigots, black and white. Raise the question. Confront the blameless ones. We are all to blame. We all must be confronted. No man gains a right to the world who will compromise. It is a matter of asking questions. And someday it will work. Because men who ask have always succeeded. Or been followed by men who have succeeded.